they were about to start a new song and bam, you know, just a really loud noise and then we saw people bleeding. Well, there it is. Mark Sihon has stolen the boat. The firing was over in a few minutes and another eyewitness said he counted nine bodies, including that of a woman. Six, he said, were wearing tracksuits. She returned home to find herself an official outcast, forced to live in relative isolation. When you have an age limit, uh, that uh, there is an, a temptation uh, for manipulation. Officially dating back to 776 BC, the Olympic Games have been a catalyst for athletic exploration, mental toughness and record-breaking feats. Having been abolished by the Roman Emperor Theodosius I in an effort to suppress paganism in 393 AD, the iconic spectacle was consigned to the annals of history for more than 1,500 years. But, with the advancement of science, technology and exploration characterising the latter years of the 19th century, along with a growing sense of nationalism, the Olympics was finally revived in 1896. Born out of the original idealistic values, the modern Olympics was an instant success, connecting European countries and the US in an unprecedented manner. Now listen guys, I absolutely love the Olympics. In fact, I became semi-obsessed with the Olympics after attending the 200m final at London 2012. And yet, you'd have to be naive to presume the Olympic process is devoid of shocking favouritism, political intrigue and blatant cheating. So instead of simply relaying a history of the Olympics, I'd rather detail the dark and unknown aspects lurking beneath the surface. There's an insane amount to cover, so please leave a like if you enjoy this so I know whether to create a part two. Thanks for watching. The 1900 Olympics, held in Paris, has been labelled by historians as the farcical games, whilst the modern Olympics co-founder, Pierre de Coubertin, described it as a miracle that the movement survived after this disastrous showing. The organisers spread the competitions over a five-month period and massively under-promoted it to the extent that many athletes never knew that they had actually participated in the Olympics. A number of athletes passed away never knowing that they were Olympic medalists. The track and field events were held on an uneven grassy field, jumpers reportedly had to dig their own pits, and the organisers didn't allow for enough room for the throwing events. Consequently, many of the discus and hammer throws ended up in the crowd. Unapologetic neglect. The 1904 Olympics, held in St. Louis, has been covered extensively on YouTube, with the marathon in particular being subject to intense scrutiny due to its lethal and irrational configuration. And yet, something far more sinister occurred in the course of the Games, unearthing the truly evil nature of contemporary Western society. The organisers introduced a separate category called Anthropology Days, Minority tribes including Pygmies, Filipinos, Native Americans and Zulus were compelled to compete in this category in a sick scientific experiment of sorts. Whilst the white athletes competed in conventional track and field events, the anthropology participants were made to take part in mud fighting, rock throwing, greased pole climbing and spear throwing events. This constituted a blatant attempt to demonstrate the inherent inferiority of many indigenous communities, with the organiser James Sullivan being a renowned white supremacist. Fortunately, the Anthropology Days category did not become a common Olympic occurrence. While recording this segment, I came across some audio from 1963 regarding George Benedict Menz's experience competing in the actual Anthropology Days contest. Unlike the majority of participants, he competed in the conventional sporting events, excelling in all of them. My name is George Benedict Men, and I won five first prize in one second. I run for an Indian race. After a fairly successful 1912 Olympic Games held in Stockholm, Sweden, many countries across Europe applied for the rights to host the subsequent Games. 
Eventually, the honor was handed to the German Empire, with the game scheduled to take place in Berlin. Now, if you know your history, you'll likely realize there was a somewhat major event looming in the background. In perhaps a bitterly ironic representation of the contemporary view at the outset of the First World War, the organisation of the 1916 Berlin Olympics continued after the war's outbreak. This was due to it not being expected that the war would continue for several years. They were sadly mistaken. Instead of being provided with the opportunity to represent Great Britain in the Games, my great-grandfather was conscripted. He would go on to be on the receiving end of a bullet in the right butt cheek, courtesy of a German sniper at the Battle of the Somme, the Forgotten Games. Berlin would have its chance to host the renowned Games, but 20 years later and under dramatically different circumstances. And this is where I get demonetized. Now, there are obviously many dark elements associated with this chapter of the Olympics, but I've decided to pinpoint what I feel is most sinister. On the 15th of September 1935, the Nazi regime announced the Nuremberg Race Laws, which effectively stripped German Jews of their citizenship and political rights. This came less than a year before the Berlin Olympics. When the then president of the Olympic Committee, Henri de Ballet Latour, noticed the anti-Semitic landscape, he threatened to strip the Reich of the Games entirely. Consequently, Berlin was carefully stripped of overtly racist propaganda to comply with the Olympic value of inclusivity. The Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, instructed the German press not to comment on race throughout the Games. And the world simply bought it. The New York Times newspaper reported that visitors left the Olympics with the impression that this is a nation happy and prosperous almost beyond belief, that Hitler is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, political leaders in the world today, and that Germans themselves are much maligned, hospitable, wholly peaceful people who deserve the best the world can give them. And yet, only three months after the Olympics, a law was passed banning Jewish teachers from public schools. The Olympic facade. The year 1956 was crucial for the Olympic movement, being the first time it was staged in the Southern Hemisphere in Melbourne, Australia. The Games were scheduled to commence in November and December, but an external atrocity would take place just before. In October 1956, a popular uprising arose in Hungary, broadly relating to anger at the treatment the country received at the hands of Joseph Stalin and born out of a desire for democratization of the government system. On November the 4th, Soviet troops moved against Budapest with great force, violently crushing the rebellion. The Netherlands and Spain boycotted the Olympics due to this Soviet aggression, yet the games went on regardless. In a bitter state of inevitability, the Hungarian water polo team would square off against their aggressors. Hungarian spectators packed out the natatorium, heckling the Soviet athletes. As Sports Illustrated reported, the ball was all but disregarded as fighting broke out all over the pool. The water ran red with blood after a Hungarian player was punched late in the match. Hungary would go on to win the gold, but rather than return home, 45 Hungarian athletes applied for political asylum in the West. Before the 1968 Olympics were held in Mexico, tensions were rising in the country. Just 10 days before the opening ceremony, students began protesting in Tlatelolco Plaza on October the 2nd. These demonstrators were rallying against the allocation of vast funds for the Olympics, while social programs were unfunded. What was meant to be a relatively peaceful demonstration quickly took a horrific turn. The government had stationed around 360 snipers on rooftops around the square, alongside military personnel lining the perimeter. Suddenly, shots began to ring out. The military were firing on the protesters. 25 people were officially reported dead, but later investigations identified 44 remains. Eyewitness estimates placed the number closer to 300. 
The Mexican government justified the act as being the lawful suppression of a violent riot to uphold a safe climate for the Olympics. This was simply not true. It was a blatant, senseless slaughter. The Mexican government would finally acknowledge that the massacre was a state crime on its 50th anniversary in 2018. The 1972 Olympics, held in Munich, were organised largely to offer the world a contrasting view to that of the horrifying spectacle of the 1936 Berlin Olympics and the Aryan racial supremacy undertones that came with it. Yet, unfortunately, it would be remembered for all the wrong reasons. The Games had already gone on for 10 days without a serious incident, and the German security officials had let down their guard. On September the 5th, armed members of a Palestinian militant group calling itself Black September snuck into the Olympic Village and kidnapped 11 Israeli coaches and athletes, killing two of them in the process, namely Moshe Weinberg and Yosef Romano. The group's mission was to hold Israeli athletes hostage and demand the release of 234 prisoners held back in Israel. The situation eventually escalated into a gun battle in which the remaining nine Israelis, five Palestinian militants and one German police officer were killed on the airport tarmac as the militants and their hostages prepared to board a plane. A truly tragic and horrific chapter in the prestigious games. There were many questions asked when Atlanta was awarded the rights to host the Summer Olympics in July and August 1996, with many doubting it had the necessary infrastructure or prestige. The Games proceeded regardless, with the broad consensus being it had gone beyond expectations and was a genuine success. However, on July the 27th, a homemade pipe bomb left in a knapsack exploded amid a crowd of spectators in Centennial Olympic Park. The blast resulted in two deaths and around 112 injuries, with one individual being killed directly from the explosion, whilst a photojournalist died of a heart attack while running to cover the event. Now, the craziest aspect about the ensuing whodunit was the shameless scapegoating. Richard Jewell, a security guard who had actually helped identify the bomb and clear the area, was accused outright, with his name being dragged through the mud. To add to this, the only evidence they seemed to have was the fact that he looked suspect in interviews. After 88 days of scrutiny and investigation, Jules' name was finally cleared. Two years later, Eric Rudolph was identified and charged for the bombing, but it was only on May the 31st, 2003, when he was actually apprehended by the police. The five-year manhunt came about due to him hiding in the Appalachian Mountains. A sad footnote in Olympic history. China's unwavering focus on achieving medal targets at Beijing 2008 would inevitably come at a cost. The Chinese government's training regime was ruthless, with parents being unable to see their child athlete for months or even years at a time. The children's sporting abilities were heavily prioritised over education, effectively trapping them in the system with no means of escape. Yang Wenjun, a C2 canoeing champion at the Athens Olympics, told the New York Times about the threats made by officials to him regarding withholding his retirement income if he quit before the Beijing Games. Meanwhile, the 110 metre hurdle champion Liu Jiang pointed to government members telling him that if he could not win a gold medal in Beijing, all of his previous achievements would become meaningless. Not winning simply was not a viable option. There were also claims made against Chinese female gymnasts being underage, with widespread beliefs that a number were as young as 14 when competing. The combination of immense pressure and youthful naivety is truly sickening to consider, especially when noting studies that found up to 18% of Chinese athletes have suicidal ideation. Hosting the Olympics can often come at a price for the local population. Unfortunately, Rio 2016 followed this trend. 
Rio has a complex winding system of favelas, otherwise known as shanty towns, many of which are deemed to be extremely dangerous due to extensive gun violence, with rival gangs effectively running the slums themselves with little government interference. This danger obviously runs counter to the friendly spirit of the Olympics, in the eyes of many at least. A report by the Commit Popular found that roughly 20,000 families lost their homes due to the Olympics, leaving thousands of children displaced and without access to education, healthcare and other social services. Perhaps more sinister was the policy of pacification. As far back as 2008, special law enforcement divisions known as police pacification units started sweeping the favelas, aggressively clamping down on drug gangs and establishing permanent police presences in three dozen neighbourhoods. Amnesty International claimed that Rio's police killed over 2,500 people in preparation for the Olympics, but we will likely never know the true figure. Well. That was a cheery video. Anyways, thank you so much for watching guys. If you've made it this far, please consider liking and subscribing. It helps myself and the channel out massively. Also, why not leave a comment below letting me know of any areas that I might have missed out on during this video. And perhaps if there's a part two, I'll include them. We'll see. If you are in fact interested about learning a bit more about the dark side of the Olympics, then check out Jules Boykoff's Power Games book. I used it for a lot of my research into this video and it is fantastic, so go check it out. Cheers. In addition, just in case the FBI is watching, I wanted to clarify, me looking into racial experiments and Nazism isn't a sign I've been indoctrinated, it was just for research purposes, okay?